everybody, welcome to the January edition of the Home Study Academy. And I apologize for the bouncing around of the dates a little bit. We've had some conflicts with other meetings. Um, Kate put a lot of work into organizing this. I call this Homesteading 2.0. It's like you've been doing it and you want to see, can I make any kind of profit or monetize this? So I'm going to turn it over to Kate, who can give you a you know, background of our speakers today. Thanks, Bill. Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, so today, we, it's a little bit of a different format. We have two presenters joining us. We're going to start with Ed Masker, who is a content creator of My, Cl My Cluttered Garage. He's going to tell us all about that, how he runs a profitable social media platform. Uh, and then we're going to move on to Suzanne Fager. She's from the Burlington County Health Department, and she's going to explain to us how you can earn a cottage food operator permit. So we wanted to pursue this topic of uh, being able to profit from your homesteading endeavors. And we're starting out with just these two topics. Uh, so we're gonna have Ed get started. He's gonna speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to ask a couple of questions of him. And then we'll move on to Suzanne. Once we get through Suzanne's presentation, we can open it up to questions for both of them. But I'll ask that you post your questions in the chat feel free to do that as the presentations are ongoing. Uh, and then Bill and I will read them to the speakers once their presentations are over. So Ed, why don't you kick us off? Great, thank you, Kate. Uh, I do wanna welcome everybody. I see some familiar names and faces out there. So uh, uh, glad we had some, some groupies follow along here. So it's good to see those folks. Uh, I wanna thank you, Kate and Bill, for uh, putting this together and really for Rutgers for, for this Homesteading Academy. I've been tuned in now for, I guess, a year or two. I'm not sure how long you've been doing it. Uh, three years? Okay. So I think the last two or so I've been tuned in, and uh, it's it's great. I mean, I, I don't know how I came across it, but I thought, you know, Homesteading Academy in New Jersey, that that that, that just sounded so interesting. And and I've learned, you know, great things about, about trees and about ticks and <laughs> different types of things. So uh, very informative. So so thank you and thank Rutgers uh, for putting this on. I, I'd like to see it uh, continue as, as well as it can. So, so thank you. Uh, so again, my name is Ed Masker. I am a lifelong Salem County resident, uh, but my wife and I recently fulfilled a dream and we purchased a 33 acre farm. Uh, we, we lived on a four acre property, which was beautiful. Uh, but we always had this desire to have more property, a little more privacy, uh, and uh, we were able to, to to purchase this property. And it's just, it's again, it's a dream come true. Uh, it's mostly wooded, uh, so we're not farming it. Uh, there's about four acres clear. The rest of it is wooded, so we'll be doing firewood and and uh, forest management. But that's uh, that's what we we have. There's an old uh, 1800s farmhouse on the property, as well as a modern pole barn, and lots of things to do. So. Uh, Regarding homesteading, uh, I you know I always thought of homesteading in my mind as something a lot more rugged. I thought of being completely off grid, you know, staking your staking your ground in Alaska and, and homesteading that way. But it's kind of taken on a new meaning uh, lately, and uh, the term is I, I feel like it's used rather loosely. But modern homesteading is kind of a lifestyle of being self sufficient uh, wherever you can be. Uh, it's really a lifestyle similar to when I think about it, how my parents and grandparents lived. I never thought of them as homesteaders, but they would, you know, they would can vegetables, grow vegetables, harvest crops, uh, might include raising poultry or or making your own clothing. But that's kind of what people did years ago. And there's there's a bit of a movement back to that uh, simple or self-sufficient lifestyle. So we're not necessarily homesteading in a lot of those ways, but we enjoy taking care of the property ourselves, which includes maintenance of the property and the structures. We do grow vegetables, uh, cutting and burning firewood, and uh, again, maintain the property with uh, my compact tractor and equipment, which is what the uh, YouTube and social media channels are about. So what we're going to talk about is how social media can play a role in this uh, new lifestyle uh, because modern homesteading has become more popular. And if you do follow social media channels, YouTube and whatnot, uh, I'm sure you follow other channels who focus on homesteading. So um, there is an audience out there of fellow homesteaders or people who are just interested in following along. And the great thing about 
YouTube and social media. And I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on YouTube because that's my primary channel, although I do have uh, a presence on uh, different platforms. But the great thing about social media is the building of a community. And YouTube is huge, as we all know. Uh, but it's made up of thousands of small communities. So that was the biggest surprise to me in starting the YouTube channel is that I met people literally from around the world, and uh, it is a small community. You get to know people really one-on-one -on -one because they interact with you in comments, emails, things like that. But it is a, it is a small community. And uh, one thing that I do with my channel is a, a weekly live stream, very much like what we're doing here today. Uh, and, uh, there's with that weekly live stream, we might have a hundred people come together every week. And for them, it's, it's a weekly reunion. They get together. They're not there just for me, but to see each other as well. So it is a, a, a neat community aspect, by the way, on last night's live stream, uh, I kind of did a little bit of a dry run talking about this topic and we blew through one hour very quickly and just scratched the surface. So I'll try to go through this as quickly as I can and clearly, but I, I do want to offer that you can reach out to me through my channels uh, if you're thinking about starting a channel. And uh, if I can be of any help at all, uh, tell you things that I've learned, please reach out to me. So uh, again, we'll just we'll just touch on a few things. So let's talk about the, the channel that I run. Uh, it's called My Cluttered Garage, and I'm going to show a video clip here in just a moment. And my first upload was in March of 2020. It was not pandemic related. It was just coincidence that that was when I uh, had started to put things together and shot my first video, uploaded March of 2020. Uh, my channel primarily features uh, work using my compact tractor, my Kubota compact tractor. The channel was originally going to offer a broad amount of content. I was thinking I'd be showing DIY projects and home repairs outdoor stuff like planting and gardening and maybe some fabrication projects. And I've done some of that on the channel, but uh, the the audience really was drawn to the compact tractor videos. So that that is a lot of what I do on the channel, although I'm introducing some other some other topics. But the idea of the name of the channel, My Cluttered Garage, was I thought, well, a garage has a little bit of everything in it. You know, it's kind of kind of cluttered and people can relate to that. But uh, you know, you can do there's just a lot of different things in a garage. So that's that's where the name came from. I am uh, currently working on this full time uh, across several platforms, which is YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, and uh, I do have a background in video production, which has made this a very natural transition. I've owned my own video production company since 1990. It, uh, you know, is scaled back now. That's kind of a part time business, although I still have that. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I do have a bit of a a benefit of having uh, a background in video production, which is extremely helpful, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. So let me just take a moment here and show you uh, about a two minute clip. It's a kind of a highlight reel of the past year of projects I've done on the property and uh, a reflection of the, of the last year for the channel. So let me show that to you and then we'll go back to the, to the topic. So I'll just share the screen here and uh, enjoy this two minute clip. Hey, welcome back to the channel. I am really glad you're here. It's the beginning of the month and there's something that I do at the beginning of every month. I like to run my generator once a month for about 15 minutes just to make sure everything is prepared in the event that I need to use the generator. There is a technique that I've been told to never do this with your front end loader. It's something that I do pretty often. I was going to hold my camera up over my head to get an artistic shot, but I was afraid that I'd be bidding on something. Boy, Sam does not waste time. I don't think he's been here an hour, and it looks like he's got this hole pretty much dug. Hey, welcome back to the channel. I am really glad you're here, and I am really glad that spring is finally here. Anne has been chomping to use the bush hog. I have. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. So today we've got this two acre meadow behind us and she is going to get to work.
This is the big announcement for the channel and for us. It is. What did we do? We bought a farm. We bought a farm. Well, let's start by doing a quick unboxing. Oh my God, that's adorable. Oh my God, this could be, this could be my favorite new tool or new favorite tool. Either way, I like it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. I am really glad you're here because today I wanna to share with you the cold hard truth about owning a compact or subcompact tractor. I am really glad you're here because today I wanna to share five tips for the new tractor owner. Today, I'm gonna to put the Woodland Mills WG24 stump grinder to work. Today, I've got kind of a weird one for you. Thanks for watching today. I appreciate you joining along on this project. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you've not yet subscribed to the channel, I invite you to join us. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. And I look forward to seeing you next time, next time. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. All right. Thanks for watching that. And uh, I am really glad you're all here. So that's a little bit of a background of what the uh, what the channel is about. It gives you an idea. Uh, certainly, uh, please do subscribe to the channel because you can reach out to me that way. There's a uh, about section uh, on the channel on YouTube and you can find an email address there. If you go to Facebook, you can you can also follow the page there and, and message me if you have questions about that as well. So um as far as uh, the channel, it's got 42,000 subscribers, 12,000 Facebook followers, 6,000 TikTok followers. So it's growing. And uh, one thing that maybe you want to know about is becoming monetized because the topic was using social media to supplement your, your homestead, uh, either via income or promoting your homestead. So you can uh, get monetized on all those platforms. Uh, Facebook, you have to have 1,000 subscribers and uh, 4,000 hours watched in the past, I think, 12 months. Uh, so that that is not, it can be difficult, but it's it's very achievable and it just takes a, a bit of focus. Um, by the way, uh, you might not know this, but the most viewed video ever on YouTube, does anybody know what it is? Probably not. It is uh, the baby shark dance. <laughs> Seven years, 13 billion views. That is the most popular video ever on YouTube. Go check out uh, Baby Shark if you want a, a, a earworm of a song. Anyway, uh, the point is that you can find an audience. They are out there. Whatever your topic is, uh, you can find the audience. The other thing is anything you want to know about YouTube, you can learn on YouTube, which is it's uh, it's amazing. If you want to learn about cameras and equipment, if you want to learn about uh, monetization, starting a channel, it's all there. So it's it's kind of uh, almost perpetual that you can find it on, on YouTube. Um, the way that uh, monetization works, uh, again, once you reach that level of 1,000 subscribers, 4,000 hours watched, you apply uh, to the YouTube Partner Program. They're all done very easily online. Your channel is reviewed, and then uh, there's really not any reason you wouldn't be monetized unless you had, I guess, questionable content. But you get monetized, and what that means is YouTube shares a portion of ad revenue with you. When you watch YouTube videos, you'll see you have a commercial at the beginning. Sometimes there are some commercials in the middle of a video and you have to wait and skip it. But uh, YouTube charges advertisers for that. And as a YouTube partner, you receive a, a portion of that. And I forget what the exact percentage is. It seems pretty fair. I think it's, you know, it's like 45% or so. Uh, so you receive that, that revenue. And uh, what that equates to if you want to do simple math and and look at your favorite channels, figure just under one penny per view. That's that's what I see as an average, uh, which is not much. You know, if you look at a video with uh, a thousand views, you're you know it's 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 not much at all. Um, but figure a little under a penny per view. So uh, you know if you're what I'm doing, making videos, I'll, I'll go out and shoot all day. 
and edit, which takes several hours. And if a video, you know, gets a thousand views, I made ten dollars. It's like that's that doesn't seem worth it. But the idea is you build the channel and you create a library, and then hopefully the, it lives on and you and it uh, it grows from there. And once in a while, you have a hit. My most popular video, which actually was produced early on, uh, for whatever reason, it took off and it has two million views. And that one is still a top performer uh, almost four years later. So you just keep putting content out there. You never know what's going to hit. And, uh, of course, that's if you really enjoy doing it. Um, so I know we're going to wrap up pretty soon here. So I want to just look at my notes and see if I have anything specific to talk about. So I can leave you some questions as well. Time for questions. Um, you do need to have, uh, obviously, an interest in production uh, you know when you say anybody can do it well that's true anybody can do it the the access is there for anyone it's very easy to shoot a video upload a video uh, so the access is there for anyone but obviously you need to have kind of a passion or a knack or an eye for photography for video for editing because it's a whole different world and it can be very tedious can be very frustrating uh, but a lot of us who live this type of lifestyle, we kind of have a, a little creative side. Uh, you know, a lot of you are producing products on your homestead uh, and uh, it, it might come naturally for a lot of people. So it goes, I think it's a good combination, the homesteading and social media content creation. There are uh, channels that really focus on either TikTok or Facebook because it's, a, it's kind of a different audience. Um, and you have Facebook posts. It's a great way to connect with an audience, especially if you have a local business, a local homestead or a farm, and you're selling products. Uh, it is a great way to stay connected with your customers and consumers. Uh, and it's essentially free advertising. So it, it's, it's almost expected because you want to keep your business front and center. Um, as far as creating a channel again we can't really get into starting a channel and and creating a channel but if you are thinking about it i would just say do your research uh before you just start a channel watch other channels that are similar to what you want to do and see the things that you like that you might not like and kind of develop your own style your own skills uh and make your content consistent uh for instance if you're going to create a baking channel uh you'll create a subscriber base that tunes in to see your baking channel. So if you uh, if you have a baking primarily baking channel and then you change the oil in your in your lawnmower, that audience is not going to really want to watch that. So it's very specific to uh, to create that that audience and that topic for your channel. Um, and you can think about that when you name your channel as well. Again, my channel was going to be a little more broad than it is. Uh, in hindsight, I might have used a different name, but you don't know sometimes until you really get started. So it's, that's why it's best to really take time before you start and, and think it through. Uh, and, uh, and just make it your own. I would say, don't be afraid to start creating content. It's awkward at first. It's, it's weird to be on camera, uh, but you do get more comfortable with it and um, don't make it bigger than it is, you know, just get started and just do it. Um, let's see if I can a couple notes. Oh yeah. It, it's awkward. You'll, you'll hate your early videos. You'll look back and think, Oh my gosh, what was I, what was I doing? But it's really fun and it's a good time. Uh, the good thing is too, you can start today with the phone in your pocket. You don't need to invest in a lot of equipment. Uh, every, almost everybody has a smartphone. The cameras on these phones are incredible. There are some pretty big channels that they simply use their phone to create content. So you have it available to you. Uh, there's editing software apps that you can put on your phone. You can do it all right from your phone, which is kind of incredible to think what's available to us. Um, and unless you're shooting those Facebook reels or YouTube shorts or TikTok videos, which are uh, vertical, you want to shoot, make sure you shoot horizontal for the, uh, for the YouTube format. But, but remember you're building an audience. So, so once you start, listen to your audience, engage with your audience in the comments uh, and see what it is that they respond to. You'll need to have a little bit of thick skin because your channel grows. You're going to get criticism. People like to criticize. I find that the Facebook community is a little more 
open to criticism. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, I get more criticism on Facebook than than YouTube, but it's out there. So uh, be prepared for that. You're going to get some insults. You're going to get people who just aren't nice and just don't respond to it and, and focus on the people who are supportive. Uh, and I mentioned that, that if you are selling products on your homestead, you can use YouTube for free advertising. You can put out content and it's a great way to connect with your local audience. Uh, so uh, that's really, uh, I want to just stop there, uh, Kate, and see if you want me to go on with anything else specific. If you have questions or anything in the, in the if there's anything in the live chat, uh, let me know. But I don't want to take up too much time because I know Suzanne has an interesting topic to discuss as well. And one of the questions I know that a lot of people have and I see it came up here, like you talked about using like your phone. Is there any other basic equipment or software you'd recommend? Like I do podcasting and I took Studio One because it was the simplest. So you've got probably a little bit more experience editing than maybe a lot of the folks, but is there a program that you use or would recommend to just starting out? I I use uh, Final Cut Pro on a, a MacBook computer, which is a professional level editing program, but it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not difficult, um, but there are free, there's a lot of free software out there now. You can use, if you have a Mac, you can use iMovie, which is free and it does a great job. Uh, DaVinci Resolve is a free program for Mac or Windows and I've not used it, but I know a lot of people who edit specifically with that. Uh, so there, there are a lot of programs that weren't available when I started with the computer editing in the early 2000s. Your only option was to buy very expensive software. Now it's available to you. So uh, again, DaVinci Resolve has great reviews and uh, you can use that on either platform. Uh, so, um, and then again, using your your phone or if you get something like a uh, like a, a GoPro type camera, like this is a DJI uh, Action 3, which is a small action camera. You can use this for almost anything. It has a little memory card in it. It records hours and hours of footage. And uh, if you want a standalone camera, something like that does a great job. They're durable and have great image quality. Yeah, and I know you and I talked about the value of a tripod, but also I remember seeing a video with your, um, what is that? The tripod that grips on branches and things so you can get different angles. And That's the, the beauty of the action cam is you can mount it almost anywhere. This one, I have a magnetic base. So I stick it to the hood of the tractor or onto a piece of equipment. It has a quick release so I can take it off and uh, there's a uh, something called a gorilla pod, which has flexible legs, so I can wrap it around a tree branch. And then I can also take this and put it on a tripod. Uh, there are a lot of technical aspects that I could go into as far as filming, you know, the things that you want to do, like use a tripod. Uh, you really want to focus on good audio. Good audio is more important than good video. You could have a beautiful video, and if your audio is not good, people will, will turn it off. Uh, but the other way, you, you could have a kind of a grainy video, but as long as the audio is clear, you'll keep the audience. So audio is important. I use external wireless microphones. Um, you block wind noise. It's, it's a lot of, you have to really focus on what you're doing, but uh, it's very important to, uh, to, to work on the visual and the audio aspects. Um, there are some really excellent questions. Let me ask one more and then we'll get to Suzanne and hopefully have uh, plenty of time to carry on in the Q&A. Um, Chris asks, did you set goals or milestones for the channel early on? How did you measure your success with it? Loosely. My goal, uh, my goal all along was to uh, grow the channel to be monetized. I knew that I knew how much work it was, and uh, I, I didn't want to keep doing it just for fun, even though I do it primarily because I enjoy it, but you can't, it's not sustainable. So to, to monetize the channel was definitely a goal of mine to reach that, that level of subscriber count so I could start to see some revenue coming in. And then once, you, once you're involved with the channel, you sort of set goals like subscriber count even though subscriber count is not that important it's really about views doesn't matter if you have a million subscribers if you don't have the views your channel really is not performing so but i still had subscriber count goals like ten thousand subscribers was a great goal i when i hit twenty five thousand subscribers it's just exciting and it, and it sort of motivates yourself um but my goal it, it, this is kind of lame but my goal really is to just keep growing but to grow uh at at, at an organic pace, which uh, homesteaders will appreciate that terminology, but that's the best way to grow your YouTube channel is organically. You don't want to have people subscribe just because 
you know, just to grow your channel. You want people to subscribe because they like your content, because they like you. Uh, and that type of organic growth, you retain your viewers and and you build a really solid channel that way. So uh, you have to be patient and look at what's working and then try to grow from that and improve on that. But uh, otherwise, uh, you know, my goals are just to, to keep working my way forward uh, to uh, to continue to learn earn a living from it. That's that's really it. That's incredible. Um, again, we have so many questions to ask later on, but I want to get to Suzanne uh, to talk about the cottage food operator permit. So Suzanne, why don't you load up your presentation and uh, get started here? We'll try to aim for twenty minutes and then uh, a long, engaging question and answer. <laughs> oh, hi everybody. So oh. If I actually hit the right, there we go. Good morning, everybody. So thank you, Ed, for that valuable information. Um, I don't know much about that stuff, but um, I love the name I cluttered garage. That would definitely get me to watch. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, how to get a college, cottage food license in New Jersey. Um, this is a relatively new program. Um, here's a little bit of background. In November of uh, 2021. Ah, sorry. The stupid windows in my way. Um, the cottage food subchapter of the retail food code went into effect. Um, before then, home prepared foods were prohibited for sale in New Jersey. We used to get complaints all the time about people making um, baked goods mostly out of their homes, and we would have to go out and tell them no, give them a violation notice. A lot of times zoning would tell them no. Um, so this um, revision in our code that existed already um, allowed there to be, um, that allowed them to operate with these specific rules and some prohibitions. Um, it's overseen by the state health department, the New Jersey department of health. Um, and then it's an application that is submitted every two years renewed. The application's available at the, um, New Jersey health, uh, department of health website. Um, the link's right here. Um, you want to, as part of the application, you have to submit the a proposed menu of your intended items for sale. You're somewhat limited. We'll get into that later. Um, also submit proof of completion of the food protection manager certification. Um, there's a variety of different organizations that offer that, and they're all listed on the web page. They made the web page really nice and user-friendly to help you navigate. Um, another part of the requirement is you have to submit a current water bill showing that your home has a municipal water supply or a passing sample for total coliform from a, a lab if the home has a well. And then there's also a list of certified labs on the webpage. Um, the point is you have to have what's known as potable water. It has to be drinkable water. It has to be um, in, in with the standards for drink, drinking water in New Jersey. Um, there's also a $100 application fee. Again, it's renewable every two years. Um, there are some labeling and signage requirements. This is probably one of the more complicated parts, I'll be honest. Um, the food that's made in their home as part of the uh, cottage food operator's license can only be served out of your home for pickup. You can deliver it to somebody, you can bring it to their home, you can meet them somewhere, um, but you can't, there's there's requirements and anything more than that. Um, you can do it as a far, at a farmer's market. So for instance, the, um, the county has the county farmer's market every year. Um, over in Morristown, um, and you could you could sell there. You can also sell at a temporary food establishment, so like a fair or a special event. Um, the requirements for selling off premises, out of your at, away from your home, um, is you have to have a sign that says your this food's prepared pursuant to NJAC A colon twenty four eleven, which is the subchapter for the cottage food section um, in a home kitchen that's not been inspected by the Department of Health. Um, that's a requirement. You have to notify the people that are buying your stuff that you were not inspected. Um, it, you also have to contact the Burlington County Health Department if you're selling at a temporary event. We have oversight on those. Um, there's a whole process. We have to make sure that you're on the website. We have to make sure you have a cottage food operator license so you could be approved to operate there. Um, here's a phone number. And uh, George Hamway manages that program. There's also labels. On the labels, you have to have the common name of what's being sold, ingredients, full ingredient list, um, what contains, and it has to be verbatim contains, and then the list of your allergens. Um, the top nine right now are dairy, um, eggs, soy, um, tree nuts, peanuts, fish, crustacean, shellfish, sesame was just added recently, wheat, 
Um, and that's all of them. Uh, you also have to have the cottage food operator license number on your labels, the name of the municipality where you um, are operating, followed by New Jersey, and then that above statement. This is what a sample label looks like at the bottom. You can see that's what it should look like. This is straight off the website. Um, it's pretty simple. A lot of times the biggest problem is getting these labels right. Um, we run into that with our uh, bakeries and our restaurants who sell off premises or they package product. Getting those labels right can be hard. Um, we have to, it's a lot of education. We have all kinds of handouts just to walk them through that process. So I really like that the sample um, label is, is available. So these are the prohibitions. Um, note what are known as TCS foods. That's time temperature control for safety. That would really it's foods requiring refrigeration. Um, it can't be anything that's gonna grow bacteria. So what the intent of this uh, cottage food operator requirement is cookies and brownies are okay. Um, they're, the water activity is not enough to grow bacteria. Buttercream icing, that's actually made of butter or cheesecake wouldn't be okay. Those things should be refrigerated. Um, and buttercream icing um, technically can grow bacteria. I know a lot of people will kind of argue that point, but you would have to prove that this particular product doesn't. And that would require laboratory analysis about the uh, water activity and some of the more scientific pieces of it. So that can be an issue. And the state health department has to review your application and it's up to them if they're gonna approve whatever you have on your menu. You can't sell at retail food establishments. I've run across this recently. I had um, restaurants that had cookies for sale at the front counter. And it was somebody who was operating out of their home. They had a cottage food operator license, but you're not allowed to do that. If you're operating in that way, then you should have your own, you should have your own facility, brick and mortar that you're operating out of. It's, it's not allowed by the, um, by the cottage food operator uh, section of the code. You can't sell product through the mail. So what I was saying earlier, you can take the product from your home. You can drop it off at somebody's home. You can deliver it to them. They can come to you and pick it up. You can do, um, online ordering, but you can't send it through the mail, like mail delivery, that's not allowed. And you can't make more than $50,000 profit in a year. At that point, I, there, it, it's expected that that's kind of your primary business and you should have your own bakery at that point. Um, this is a sample list of the approved foods. This is straight out of the code. So it's mostly baked goods, um, candy counts that doesn't have to be kept refrigerated chocolate covered pretzels um herb seasonings mixtures that's something people don't think about jams is on here actually fruit jams fruit jellies uh baking mixes pasta you can see that it's a pretty it's a pretty large list and you can always ask if there's something that's not on this list that you think fits you can always ask and, and they would have to um assess that from the state on your application um, and then this is your contact person from the Department of Health who manages that program. Her name is Virginia Wheatley. And um, this is the general email address for the state health department. So um, I can, I'm going, this is the, this is the end of my present of that piece. Um, I do have. Looks good. You got it? Okay. I'm trying to shrink the window because it's... Okay. Oh, that's it. You just okay. want to increase the um, the zoom on the actual document, but otherwise looks good. Okay. I'm going to go to the website first. So this is the website for the health department. Um, this is the cottage food page, home bakers, cottage food operators. It goes through, everything is here that I just shared with you. Um, the section in the code which is subchapter 11. Um, this is a database of all the currently active cottage food operators in the state. It's updated weekly. Um, this is information for your initial application. This is the instruction document. I'll show you that in a second. And this is the actual application. Read the directions. It's like a two page instruction document. They wouldn't give you that if it wasn't gonna be valuable. Um, and then you have to mail it to them. You can't, um, you can't do you can't submit it online um and you can't drop it off <laughs> there's a whole section in the f 
frequently asked fre frequently asked questions. Sorry. Um, and then this is the food protection man for food protection manager certificate. And at the bottom, there's organizations. This is the copy of the water bill, recent coliform test, and but you can submit. You can submit online. You just can't submit in person. That's what it is. You can't drop it off. Um, this is the renewal information. Same thing. And then at the bottom, these are your food manager certification. So it's like an eight hour class. Some of them you can take online. They've gotten a lot more flexible since the pandemic. It used to be you had to be there in person and take a proctored test and it was a little harder. Um, this is more about the, well, the water requirements. This is the list of foods that you can have. And then these are the allergens. Um, so, oh, they didn't put sesame in yet. Um, the FDA food code just added sesame as an allergen at the end of last year. They haven't updated the website yet. I was a little ahead. Um, and then that's pretty much it for that. Um, did it switch over when I switched over, Kate? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then this is the cottage food um, operator application instructions. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, it's just good to kind of know where this is. And again, it goes into the list walks you through a lot of the information. And then this is the actual application. Looks like a fillable PDF, good. Um, you have to put all of your products that you're selling, your whole menu. And then that's um, a big piece of it. It's funny, when my, my um, let me stop sharing. My, um, supervisor who just retired about seven years ago she has a cottage food operator license she does cookies and she makes she makes the best gingerbread men and she goes to different craft fairs and she sells them there and she really enjoys it um i'm warming up to a little bit more <laughs> i haven't gotten any complaints um the state health department handles the complaint end of it they don't come in your house and inspect you per se but if there's a complaint that comes in that either you are there's a problem if there's an outbreak if somebody gets sick from your food if you're deviating from what that what you're approved to vend, then they they'll come in they'll they'll check you out and and investigate the complaint of course. Um, also, if you're at a temporary event and we look over and we see that it's not just cookies you're making cheesecakes or you're making you you deviated from what you're what you could possibly be doing um, and what your permit says, then we have the ability to prohibit you from doing that if if you're operating out of your home. Uh, on the retail food code because it's in violation of what you were approved to do. I hope that all makes sense. Um, and I think that kind of covers it. Um, so does anybody have any questions or are we moving on? Oh, yes, Suzanne. Oh, you generated questions. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I do have a lot of questions. I okay. think uh, we should start with the rapid fire of um, what about this, what about that uh, yeah. sort of things. Um, so how about canning vegetables like uh, pickles or ketchup? No. Okay. So once you get into what's known as reduced oxygen packaging and pickling, those that those are, are what are what those are known as specialized processes. You are treating a food to make it not TCS. And once you do that, even if you were doing that in a retail facility, if if it's a place we inspect, if you decided to make pickles and jar them you would have to go to a lab. If you can, you always have to go to a co-packer or to a facility that does retort because you're retorting at that point. And it's very dangerous. Um, canning gets very picky, very um, particular. Actually, canning is kind of easy for us because we just send you to a retort facility. But pickling, you'd have to prove that the, the process is going to work. You'd have to send it to like a food lab and prove to us that what you're doing is is good, is appropriate and you can't do that anything like that in um for the re for the uh cottage food operator it has to be something that is already considered a non TCS food and you can't alter it in any way i hope that makes sense here's, a, here's another one on the list here <laughs> um somebody wants to make honey butter with raw honey um you need a license it says you know you need a license to sell honey but what about selling honey butter um, I think that's on the list of things that you can do with the cottage food operators license. 
Um, I mean, unless you're adding, I can't think of anything that you'd be adding that would be an issue, but same thing, you'd have to apply to the state and then you'd have to have your ingredients. And if there's an ingredient that looks, well, we're not quite sure if this is going to work, then they would question you on it. Um, but just making peanut butters and nut butters is perfectly acceptable. And would, and would possibly be, it would, should be approved. But they should contact the state. But the state, yeah, you'd have to do the application or contact the state about that because they do the, um, they approve you to do those things. Okay. There's a, a question about storage. Um, Cindy wants to sell dried flowers and herbs um, for tea, but there's a question about, do they need to be stored in the kitchen or can they be stored outside of the house? Um, I would say you should have a dedicated storage spot. Um, I don't even know if the state asks about that. That's a really great question. I never thought about it, but it should be in, probably in an area with very low humidity because you always run the risk of having uh, larvae in certain types of dry products. And if the um, humidity is not taken into account, then that can be an issue and you could possibly get organisms um, that come out of that um, egg state. Does the state... Uh ask also about the processing um, because Cindy's question is about, can you dry them, you know, inside the home, outside the home, like the actual drying process. Oh, you mean, okay, I'm sorry. I wasn't following. I was oh, thinking it's of two questions. the storage of the product once it was done. Yes, both, both, yes. Both, okay, so the drying process, um, that's something that the state would have questions about. Um, so you would put down dried, various dried herbs, or you'd want to be specific as possible in this application. So you don't necessarily get the follow-up questions. Um, if it's something that looks like it could be potentially a problem, because that's their job as they're reviewing it, because sometimes people don't understand that what they're putting in their menu is not an appropriate food for this purpose. Like that particular thing is not going to work. That particular thing might not work. I had, um, here's something garlic, like garlic and oil mixtures jarred garlic and oil mixtures. Well, garlic and oil mixtures are always what's considered a TCS food because botulism can be an issue with those if you're not doing it properly. And so that's something you don't always think about and you think it's kind of fine in, in when you're doing it, but when you send it to the state, you'll get you'll probably get disapproved for that. Here's another one that's pretty common that I get from a lot of people, canning of salsa, um, water bathing products since it falls in line with jam, yes or no? Is it can if it's well can canning is a different thing you'd have to go to a retort facility for any canning but jarring of salsa, um I would say it depends what's in it. Depends what pH is. Um, I'm trying you would you don't you want to put that into the application. I can't remember if that was on the list or not. I know jams are not a big deal. We've run across problems with salsas depending upon what's in them. Again, if you if it's a full ingredient list, the state might notice an ingredient that's an issue. Um, and you might need to um, maybe change your recipe a little bit because possibly if there's a corn or if there's um, actually that's probably a TCS food because most people have corn or they have uh, beans if they have black beans or anything like that in there so maybe if it's just tomato by itself but probably not anything else um, do you know if people that are pursuing a cottage food operator license ever get any type of limited liability insurance added um, since they're working out of their home and maybe the cottage food law doesn't cover any I, risks of what they're doing. I don't think, I don't think they tell you that you have to have insurance. I mean, it's always a consideration, um, but it's not as a requ it's not a requirement like it would be when I do body art inspections you have to have liability insurance um but it's not a requirement for the cottage food law but some of your events that you go to they might tell you you have to have insurance like some of the temporary events that you might want to vend at they'll make sure you have that or sometimes you're covered underneath their insurance it really just depends where you're vending so always look into where you're vending and check on that I just remembered something else um you always want to make sure if you're doing anything out of your home, you have to be in, you have to check with the township because if you're not in, if you're not approved by zoning, that's a problem. They'll come and they'll shut you down. 
say you're not, you're in violation of this, that you can't operate a business out of your home in whatever township. And there are townships that are like that. So always look into that before you even start the process. So you don't spend money for no reason. And then you're, you have this license that you can't do anything with. Um, have people, I guess you talked about how you can deliver products rather than people having, uh, having them come to your home, because, um, some people might be concerned about, you know, people that you don't know coming to your home, um, to purchase your products, other creative solutions, since you also can't deliver, uh, I mean, through the mail. The, the big thing is, is really just having like a common place to meet, to drop the product off. Um, and then having those working out of the events, say it on your webpage, I'll be at this event at this time, come and find, come see my stuff. Um, since you're so limited in how you can get the product to the consumers, you only have a handful of ways that you really can do it. Um, many more questions. Um, can you add foods after your initial application? What's the process like for that? You might, uh, there's probably an amendment application. Um, so the way I've seen these cottage food licenses, usually what it says is you're approved for, and it's kind of a, a broad, you're approved for cookies and brownies. Um, so if you add a type of cookie or a type of something that falls in that category, you're probably going to be okay. If you add something completely different, then you might need to contact the state. Always reach out to the state and ask them, do you need me to submit something else? Because the worst that'll happen is if you're noticed at an event with something that's not on your license, then it could start raising some eyebrows and people asking questions. Um, I know some health departments will come by and they'll, they'll ask you questions and they'll check to make sure that your sign is up. They'll make sure that your cottage food operator information, they'll make sure your labels are acceptable. Um, just to, and, and that those pieces are important. Um, but if they notice something that's not on the cottage food operator license that you're not approved for, then again, they could tell you, you can't sell that. Here's another question for you, Suzanne. What about selling food that other people make out of your farm stand? Um, farmers, oh, farmers markets are okay. That's a good question. I have to think about that. I'll have to look that one up. Um, farm stands, you're kind of selling out of a retail food establishment. But if you go to, it says farmer's markets. So that might be okay. I have to look into that one. Sounds like it's an interpretation issue. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's exactly what it is. Um, it says farmer's markets. I think farmer's market, I think going to Columbus, but that's also a temporary event. And so it says two different things on there for a reason, or you go, so that might be, again, open to interpretation. So I'll, I'll check on that one. I can get back to everybody on that. Rachel just wanted to clarify that her question is about uh, a farm stand on your property, not a farm market. Right. Okay. Um, let me ask uh, one more question, and then I'll, I want to get back to a couple of Ed's questions before we circle back around. Um, there's some confusion about selling canned jams and jellies um, because I I can't remember now what the list said, but uh, it seemed like maybe our conversation was causing some confusions. Um, so can you just clarify about jams and jellies, how you're allowed to sell them? Because it sounds let like- me, Let me pull up that list again, if that'll make it a little easier. Cause I did kind of blow past that really fast. Um, jams and jellies, because they tend to be a low um, pH food, um, they've been kind of recognized as not very, uh, as, as safer um, than some of the other things that you encounter. So you'd have to give the ingredient, there it is, the ingredient list. Um, if there's something that is on there that the state determines is not appropriate and could be a problem. Um, then they would just say, no, you can't have this particular, you can't do this. But again, most fruits are low pH, so it's not going to grow bacteria. That's why they did. That's why they allow it. Because uh, if the pH is below 4.6, it won't grow bacteria. And then it's considered a non-TCS food. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So these sound like guidelines and then you really need to approve everything uh, 
with the state. Or... Yeah, the state needs to approve every application because again, people add things um, and if they don't have every ingredient, they can't determine if it's really safe or not. They'll say, you know, jams and jellies are generally considered safe, but we need to see what the ingredients are. If they're just fruit jams and jellies, that's different too, because again, it's that it's more of a lower pH food that shouldn't grow bacteria. Uh, let's circle back around to some of the questions for Ed. Um, Ed Ginger was asking about tips for growing your Facebook and Instagram besides just regularly posting. I know you mentioned uh, that engaging with your audience was important for kind of building that connection, but do you have other tips for expanding uh, your audience? Yeah, well, one thing that uh, gets repeated sort of in the in the community of content creators is look at what works. So I, I saw that post about having a, a million views on an Instagram post. So look at that and and see what it was about that that interested people and make a follow-up video to that or follow-up post. Uh, that for there's something about that that attracted people, whether it was a video or a post or a picture. Uh, something's interesting and obviously people like that. So you try and create more content similar to that. You you want to kind of roll with what what works, what's popular. So that and then again to to post consistently. Things like Instagram and Facebook are very interactive. So it's great to post questions. And rather than just post something, post it in the form of a question to get people to interact with it. Uh, and uh, the the almighty algorithm looks at activity on all these types of platforms, YouTube, all of them. When it sees that people are engaging in the comments, that people are clicking the like button, uh, that people are subscribing or just watching the video, the algorithm sees that and says, oh, people must like this. So now I'm going to send it to more people. And it kind of snowballs from there. So you do want to be interactive as much as you can, uh, post regularly, and again, find what appears to be working, which is why I, I do a lot of content with the compact tractor, because I know that people, for whatever reason, that's a popular topic. So you want to see what works and then, and then build from that. And we've got a question here on personal safety. Do you have any tips, like, especially if your location becomes known or sort of people start, you know, see your channel and they get to know where you are, any tips that you can offer on that? Yeah. I, I don't know that I have any tips other than if you're concerned about that, just be aware of of what you're sharing. Um, I tend to not talk about where I'm from. It's not hard to figure out for somebody who has a little bit of internet savvy, but uh, I generally, on my channel, I don't share my last name. You know, this is one of the most public things I've done. Uh, I share my first name only. I never talk about what town I live in. Um, I tell people, people ask all the time where you are, and I just tell them Southern New Jersey uh, and just general area like that. Uh, but you know, I do, I do keep that kind of private. Uh, if I'm recording anywhere publicly, locally, I try not to show the street sign. N not that I'm afraid of anything, but it's just, it it's something you have to be aware of, especially I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what if this channel did grow to a really big following? And then you, you sort of lose some of that control. So if you're concerned about that, I'd say, take it seriously. And um, just be aware of of what you're sharing, and try not to uh, try not to share uh, anything personal publicly. Um, but uh, otherwise, like I don't share my address. I've had viewers write to me, and they they're like, uh, you know, I want to send you some stickers from that I made or something. And I don't have a PO box. Maybe I'll get one at some point. I don't know. You know, if I get a PO box, it's going to be in a local town. So again, they, they can kind of triangulate and figure out where I am anyway. Not, and again, not that I'm afraid of that, but uh, at some point I'll probably get a, a remote PO box so that if I do receive letters or, or correspondence from people, it won't come directly to the house. I do share my address with fellow content creators that I've, that I've grown to trust. Uh, I do work with companies, which I didn't even talk about this part. You do get some sponsorships. Uh, I review certain pieces of equipment on my channel and companies will agree to send me that equipment or that tool to review. Uh, they send it at no cost to me. So that's kind of a perk. And uh, then I'll review that piece of equipment. So I'll share my, obviously my shipping address with those companies because they're, a, you know, they're a trusted, trusted company. So uh, um, that may not help much because I don't have any specific answer to being, to being private other than just be, 
be aware, be aware of, of what you're sharing. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Uh, hey, Suzanne, can you clarify one more time about uh, what is TCS? Like, what does that stand for? Uh, it's time temperature control for safety. So it's the health inspector way of basically saying it's perishable or needs to be refrigerated. Um, it really means it's not going to grow bacteria. So if you have milk or you have anything that has to be refrigerated that you keep out of the refrigerator, um, it's temperature dependent, right? So who... <laughs> Uh, so who do people, no problem. Um, who do people contact if they want to sell stuff that uh, doesn't fit this non-TCS category? Then they would contact us. You'd have to do it out of a, an inspected facility. So it'd be a retail food establishment. So you'd have to have a, a storefront or, or something like that. You can't do those things in your home. Um, and then it's te that's temperature control for safety. Then time would be if you let it sit out for an extended amount of time, it'll still grow bacteria. So if you had something out for two hours, it wouldn't be long enough to grow enough bacteria to get somebody sick, but it's still dependent um, on time and temperature. Um, and that's something there are, you know, we have plenty of like commissary kitchens. We have a couple in the county right now where you can rent space and you can operate out of there um, and make your product get inspected by us. And you can, places have food trucks, so they'll um, sell off of a food truck and they'll use that as their base of operations, or they sometimes have a retail food a food business that operates out of that uh, base of operations or commissary. Um, the only thing is you have to make sure you have a place to store it that's not at your home. You'd have to store it where it's in where you're inspected, where you're making the product. So that's an option. I know like Philadelphia, they have like rental kitchens. That's not, that's not, we're not quite there. You go into a facility and it's fitted out with multiple kitchens. Um, we only have a couple of those in the county and they're relatively new. But that would be your option if you wanted to sell something that was considered TCS or potentially hazardous is the old um, phrase. Um, I have one question for Ed quickly about uh, recommendations for the length of your videos and how frequently you do post. Sure, uh, so it, it's recommended to post uh, and upload consistently. And that's important to remember to really um, be honest with yourself about what you can do. When you first start out, you're like, oh, I love doing this. It's great. I'm going to post every two days. And then and then you find you can't keep up with that pace. So you want to come up with a schedule that you know that you can keep up with. It's good to upload, I think, at least weekly, maybe every other week in a long form uh, video such as YouTube. And uh, the length, they recommend seven to 15 minutes. If you're monetized, uh, you sort of suit for that eight minute goal because when you have an eight minute video, YouTube will place a mid roll ad, which uh, which means that there'll be a commercial in the middle of your video somewhere. And that's just a little more uh, revenue. But uh, uh, so seven to 15 minutes is the recommended amount. A lot of my videos are only three to five minutes long. Uh, if you are posting on uh, the TikTok Reels or Face or Facebook or Instagram, you probably post more frequently to something like that. Uh, but the long form videos, you know, once a week if you can. Uh, if you can do more than that, that's great. But I, I I generally post once a week, trying to grow that a bit. Although it's more difficult when the weather is not cooperative. Um, so that's that. I did want to also mention that I did put my email address in the live chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to me directly. I'm happy to answer questions as I can from there. So my email address is in there. Uh, and then uh, uh, recommend again following other uh, other channels. Uh, I did want to mention a couple local channels that we have, uh, a couple, couple local farms that have channels. One is Sickler's Circle View Farm. That's local. And Rachel uploads frequently. I think she has mostly a Facebook presence. Uh, but she does a little short content, and that helps promote their farm because they're selling products on their farm. And then Triple C Angus Farm is a local farm that sells uh, meats and things. And uh, Corey uploads frequently to that as well. And it, it keeps you engaged and will bring people to your farm. That kind of goes against what you were asking about privacy, but sometimes you're not concerned about privacy. You want to bring people to your small storefront or whatnot. But uh, reach out to, to channels like that, follow them, and watch what they're doing. Then, real quick question for you. I'm looking at some of the questions in the list. If something doesn't fall neatly into one of those categories for the cottage food law, 
Is it best to go to your county health department or state to ask? Shh. Sorry, my kids are home and they're getting antsy. So um, great question. So you could kind of do either. Um, if you want to do if you want to do cottage foods and you go to the state and you ask them and they say no way, then you would come to us. You can come to us and we can look at it and say, well, you should probably check with the state. If it's something that's just completely off the wall and we know there's no way you'll get approved, we'll tell you. Um, but the state ultimately issues the permit and um, they would be able to say yay or nay. Um, I think I have an answer to the question from before. Sorry, I was trying to figure it out. I was looking on my phone, just check the code. Um, if you wanted to sell at a farm stand, I don't think you could do it in the retail part, but I think what you could do is you could set up like a temporary setup and then you could sell accordingly, but it would have to be your business would have to be set up at that location as a temporary stand. Does that make sense? And so then you're still temporary and you're not retail still. You'd still have to have your sign. You'd still have to have your labels. You'd still have to have your cottage food operator permit, but you would have to kind of man the, the stand basically. But if it's your own personal farm stand, that doesn't apply because you're selling directly at your property. I think you might have to have, ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> you might have to have it set up, set up separately. You might not be able to use the same transaction. You might not be able to sell it through because it's different businesses. But if you have a farm stand that had a kitchen, then you would be selling your product out of the kitchen anyway. I guess that would be the question too, is if you don't have, if it's just a, it's like a just eggs and uncut fruit farm stand that has no kitchen, I'm assuming. Okay. We're gonna have to have you. You, you could probably do it if you had it separate. Again, that's something that I'd have to look at again, but. That might be a way around it. It also depends upon what the locals tell you too. Like you can or can't do that. Um, the local health department would probably have some say in that. Any final questions, Bill? No, uh, <laughs> a, lot to, a lot to cover in one day. A lot to cover in one day. Um, I really appreciate everyone's engagement today with our speakers and thank you to Ed and Suzanne for joining us and uh, also fitting in the time so we could have such an engaging question and answer session. Um, we'll have to do this again, maybe with some different topics about supplemental income from the homestead. Um, so with that, I think we'll wrap up for today. I will, what I'll do is I'll send a follow-up email to everybody that's attended here uh, with the contact information for our speakers, as well as some resources that each of them has shared. Uh, so it might be kind of a long email because we had so much to talk about today. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions about the Homesteading Academy, you can reach out to me directly, um, and we'll hope to see you back again. And Ed, be prepared. I have a feeling you're going to get a lot of emails today. Sorry, Ed. <laughs> well, thank you, and I, I think you should have a uh, maybe a series with Suzanne, a lot of questions uh, for her, too, so uh, really interesting topic. And I did see one question question about an email list. If you sign up for this, you're on Kate's email list. Um, she maintains an email list of everybody's on the Home Study Academy. Yes, no. you have to opt out. You're, you're automatically in. <laughs> no, thank you, everybody, for your time. Very informative. I appreciate everybody for speaking.